So overall, I'm going to very briefly, you know what an IAM is. I'm just going to give you a quick um, piece of that so you can think about what sort of in the way we're looking at it here. I'm going to talk about uncertainty. Just talk about some sources of uncertainty and give a couple examples looking at that. And the way I'm doing that will lead into these issues of model validation. How do you validate a model like this? And then I'm going to have a talk about what this means for future scenarios. And then there's a homework assignment for that to think about. So have you seen this graph before? Well, at least I have a new graph for you. So integrated assessment models combine information from different disciplines into one framework and different models make different trade-offs, but the key thing that I'm trying to point out here is that there's a bunch of inputs into the model. You have your model, um, which it's complex enough that it's a bit of a black box, and you saw that in the presentations where you go cool is here to help you figure out why you got what you got, and it takes a while to figure out what's going on. Then you get outputs. Um, I like to say these are not truth machines. These are not predictive in the same sense that you you know, that we can predict the weather. You know, and because we can't actually forecast many of the important factors such as technology or human reactions that human soci sociology and technological developments, um, but they're useful to examine different things like different assumptions for technology, what the realm, so that's some of the things we're gonna to explore today is, is what they can and can't do. And this was a graph from the ARA 5 so this is um, abatement cost as a function of the fraction of the baseline reduction. So as you increase emissions reductions, then models, the cost tends to go up. And then you, you, you know that. But the interesting thing is that, of course, there's this big spread. So if you could reduce emissions to 20% of baseline levels at 1% GDP loss, that's a very different policy world than if it's 5% of GDP loss, right? So that's just one example of the type of uncertainty that we want to try to understand. So, so this is some sources of uncertainty and just briefly talk through some of these. And they go from, from an integrated assessment standpoint from input assumptions roughly to things that are more in terms of model dynamics and structure. So the climate response, say climate sensitivity, that's something we input. The model does not endogenously produce that. A GCM does, but these models don't. Um, GDP and population are things that we tend to put into the model. Um, future evolution of technology costs, and GCAM we put that in. Some models have elements of endogenous technological change, learning by doing, so that can be sometimes an input, sometimes the output. But these are things that we don't know. We don't know which technologies are going to become cheap or how cheap they will become or what new things might come along. So new technologies. This is a big uncertainty. We actually did a model high caps with GCAM over just the 20 year period and of course not for, for buildings. We looked at buildings in the US. And, and of course one of the things that if you just started the model in 1990 let it move forward, it gets wrong, is that there was a huge um, increase in plug loads. You know, this, this, you know, all these things. Well, we didn't, you know, you can't, nobody predicted that, you know, the magnitude of that. You really can't, right? I mean, you, know, you, you might assume it will increase. Um, fossil and non fossil resources, um, there's actually uncertainty in where you start from because we actually don't know that data exactly. Um, what were these service demands? These are, these are the primary drivers of energy use. And I should add food there as well. Um, you know, how much building floor space, how much heating demand, how much, you know, I don't know, computing services demand or something, um, how much passenger kilometers, freight kilometers, and so on. That's, those are things that drop, they're what drive our energy use. They're, they're why we use energy, because we actually want things for services. They're also heavily dependent on technology, too. That's and they depend on technology. There's a mm -hmm. feedback there, right. right? Because you may want passenger kilometers, but then it depends on how efficiently that can be provided. Exactly, so there's interactions in here. Um, response of demands to price changes. So that's a particular thing that of interest to that previous graph I showed. Technology choice moves, mechanism assumptions, how trade comes in. So this is all, all these different things. Any any thoughts on other other uncertainty? 
Kriegs gegen den Decker. And there's things like um, agricultural yields, that's a type specific type of technology on Thursday, right? Um, there's physical, other physical science things like how would temperature impact carbon stocks, which depends where you go. Okay, we got we have more chance. Any questions? Sure. So let's look at a case study. In 2000, there is this IPCC special report on scenarios, SRES, which publishes a set of scenarios. And these were, um, they published six marker scenarios, um, and then there were 40 other total scenarios in total, so that's a gray down. So that's where they, that's what these scenarios look like. And this is a paper that we published looking at this, uh, and for a reason that I won't get into, but, but these are, the dots are CDX um, carbon dioxide emissions. From, from Oak Ridge. So that's their estimate of carbon dioxide emissions up to, in this case, about 19, 2008, and then it was extrapolated 2009. And, and these scenarios published in 2000. So this is comparing what actually happened to what had been projected back then. And, okay, estimate, you know, this was in the range, a little bit on the high side, but within the range, and the recession in 2009 sort of brought them back closer to the middle. And one of the issues of thinking it this way about comparing the models is these are projections with 10 to 15 year time steps. So you sort of need to compare on that basis, really, because the models, and really what I like to say, if the model time step is 10 years, the results really only start to make difference after make sense after two or more time steps, really, because you know, that you're not resolving really the dynamics over 10 years. So, so let me try another graph. So this, um, so this looks a little different. This crosses for actually the um, CO2 estimates updated um, last year, earlier this year. And you see a bit of a different picture. It, it is fuzzier, that wasn't deliberate, but um, now actually these SRS, SRS scenarios were, now it was much more on the high side, although the recession brought it back closer to the middle, so that's one point. So what up? Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess back, I mean back to your uncertainties and, and also kind of comparing it with the, the time steps. You, you mentioned how like agriculture yields is an uncertainty, but if you're looking at a 10 to 15 year time step, something like a drought coming in and killing the corn crop is not really something you're interested in from a 10 to 15 year time mm -hmm. step. It's more, so you, I mean, it's not really an, it's not, I mean, it's uncertain, be, uncertainty, but I guess it's not really an uncertainty in terms of this model. You, you guys just don't care, right, about? Well, it, we, we actually do, in a, in a sense. Well, well yeah, I mean, you, but from a modeling perspective, like from a modeling perspective from a 10 to 15 years, it's right. kind of. Well, what we end up caring about, and we're actually gonna start looking at this, um, this in GCAM research over the next few years is um, if you had droughts become more frequent, yeah. now that would start to matter. Yeah. Right? So that's the sort of thing that we do. But you're exactly right. So this is this question of now we've got a bit longer of a history to compare it to. These were released in 2000. Now we got 15 years of history. Now we're getting a little bit more comparable with the right. But it's exactly an issue of comparing like with like. Any other comments on this that you can see? Yeah, I'm just curious that the um, the CDNC data is generally lower than the than the CO2 measurements from the other. They're actually more or less from the same source. Um, the, the GCP just updates it. But yeah, there's so that's actually. Is there a reason? Just out of curiosity, that this yeah. this is legitimate differences in um, changes in the historical record. So data got updated, and the newer estimates are a little higher. So I, so I could come from the other way and say that I'm really surprised this looks so good. The comparator looks so good. <laughs> yeah, I think it's that, yeah. Yeah, and, and actually the reason we published this letter is that somebody um, wrote a paper saying, oh, the SRS scenarios, the real reality actually, comparing to this data, this older data even, 
is, is uh, reality is, is above the highest estimate in the SRAS scenario. We looked at it and said, what? And they, they actually misrepresented the SRA. They did some odd sort of averaging, which, you know, completely. So if you actually go look at this, this reference, um, you'll actually see us talk about that if you're interested. So, yeah, so. But, but this, you know, wasn't the point I wanted to make. But yeah, that's one of the points. As a matter yeah, of fact, considering uh, considering the range of things you're assuming, and it's it's, re it's actually remarkable that things look like that in a way. You know? Yeah. So one other point is that some of that flattening recently is actually due to the climate policy. I mean, Europe has reduced emissions. Um, U.S. is starting to, although the, the reduction in U.S. emissions really isn't due to climate policy up to this point. It's mostly due to fracking and natural gas. But we now have a policy where you can't build a new coal plant unless it has CCS, so that will reduce. So there's some climate policy in there. So you also have this issue of, are you comparing apples to apples in that sense, right? So these are actually no policy scenarios where now the world is, you know, there is no such thing as a no climate policy world. So, um, but there, there still is this question, interesting question that these, a lot of these projections were a lot lower than, you know, the history. So what went on? Now, one thing, if you had baselined these projections to this higher historical, the, this fan would be shifted up a bit, right? So we were baselining to an older historical data. But here's one, so this is um, China GDP per capita growth rate. So this is the lines, the, the dots, are the SRA, four SRAS scenarios, or four of them. Well, there were only four GDP projections. And they were, you know, these were created around 1998. I mean, we published in 2000, you know, we were nailing down these assumptions a couple years before that. And then these newer SSP scenarios that are being, you know, the, scenario, the assumptions for those were from about 2012, 2013. So basically, we did, then let's. This this is at GDP per capita, and they're much lower. So let's let me actually move to um, growth rate space because that's a little easier. See, so this is the growth rate over each of these intervals. So so this is historical to the extent we know it, which for China is particularly problematic. But it's, you know, there's issues with all countries, and these are the SSPs. So actually. By 2035, the SRES growth rates look a lot like these SSP scenarios. So the conventional wisdom is still that over a long term, you've got you know sort of six percent long term growth is like the highest. You know these experts think that economies would grow based on historical patterns. But what they missed was um, you know the, the highest growth rate in. The SRS scenarios was around a little under eight percent, so sort of slowly declining, you know, or more rapidly declining. Whereas in reality, China had this decade or and a half of really high growth rates, and that just changed it completely, you know. So then, when you actually aggregate that up, you've got you're starting your by the time in 2020, we're outside this range because it wasn't anticipated this sudden, you know, economic shift, these large growth rates. And it's just a very different baseline going forward. And then by the time you get out here, this is a big difference. It's from an upper end of twenty-five thousand dollars per capita, you're going you're like thirty-five or forty thousand dollars per capita on the upper end. Very big difference. So two more uncertain examples, and then we'll maybe stop and talk about this a little bit. So this gets to Cole's comment. Um, this was a paper that a colleague led of how, what do historical trends tell about near-term trajectory? So basically, this, this blue line is the CDAC CO2 again. And then the thin lines are, if you took the preceding um, five years and extrapolated linearly 10 years ahead, what would you get? And basically you get not a very accurate forecast. Um, so basically the five to 90% range of this you know, spread is about 
plus or minus 45 percent the error you know difference between actual and what was there and you know that makes sense right i mean the, the if, if we could predict the future well from the past five or ten year history you know the stock market would act a lot different than it does but it turns out it's very hard to predict the economic growth in that period so it's just another indication that this short-term prediction stuff is very difficult. Um, so another one is uncertainty and where we're starting from. So these are estimated uncertainties from for these different emissions, fossil CO2, land use, land use change, <coughs> methane, nitrous oxide, fluorinated gases, sulfur dioxide, black carbon. So all these things impact climate. We have greenhouse gases. We have um, aerosol and aerosol precursors. So, so here's a question for you. Why, why are some of these much bigger than others? We have fossil CO2 that's maybe plus or minus 28 percent. So these are all um, 5 to 95 percent by all ranges. But then some of them are plus or minus 50 percent, 60 percent, 100 percent. Why are they big? Uncertainties uh, related to the instruments you use to sense the emissions. So what the sensitivity Sports. of the instruments, and if if you're counting them that way, I guess. Mm -hmm. So how well, how do you know how we how do we get these emissions? How do we get these estimates? Do you satellite? Can you get do you satellite and see to yeah? Uh, well, for the most part, they're um, bottom up inventory where you know you take an emissions factor and plant activity but you try you have to measure that emissions factor um so and then you can have some top-down constraints so if you measure the amount of n2o in the atmosphere and you know the lifetime which we think we have a good idea you can get the top-down constraints but it's still what other what other other reasons why some of these things well i've learned from another course um um, about carbon cycle and uh, so basically the CO2 emissions from the land surface is very difficult to uh, quantify and it has a lot of uncertainty so here you're showing plus or minus 50 percent from land use mm -hmm. land change and uh, land use change and uh, so that's what I learned from and then why, why would the fossil CO2 be lower If, if their stability has anything to do with it um, in the atmosphere with, with difficulty in measuring it? I don't know if that's... Well, it's more, I'll say it's more due to the difficulty in understanding the emissions factors or emissions processes. So, any other thoughts? I was, I was thinking the, the source itself, I mean, the, I mean, when you, if you look at land use, land use change, it's, it's, it's a little bit more diffuse, it's probably more heterogeneous because you're doing a bunch of things. Fossil fuels is basically, you know, you're, it's combustion. It's a combustion process. It's, mm -hmm. So the process is more understood, maybe, and then there's, so maybe that's. And, and how about comparing fossil CO2 and black carbon? They're both from combustion. Yeah. Why would black carbon be more <laughs> uncertain? So, yeah. I'll, I'll, that's okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> so what happens when you combust coal? I mean, physically, or oil, or natural gas. I mean, you're taking this hydrocarbon, you burn it, you burn it. So what happens to the carbon, and hydrogen atoms, and so on that are in that fuel? I mean, they, they're burning it, right? It ends up in CO2, right? almost all of them. Yeah, they get, well, they get transformed into different compounds, et cetera. But, right, but what happens is all, most of it is CO2. Right, because you're and you're actually trying to combust all of it to CO2 for that phase of energy, right? But so black carbon and actually for that matter, well I didn't have one here, but so black carbon is soot and that the emissions factor for soot can vary over like three orders of magnitude for a given process. 
depending how efficient it is. If you burn very efficiently, you'll get very little soot. So in a modern pulverized coal power plant, supercritical coal power plant, that's operated well, you get very little soot. Because it's burning at high temperature, you don't want to produce soot. You want to be burning this stuff up. Whereas, um, you know, an inefficient, poorly tuned diesel truck, you know, that, that compared to a well-tuned truck, it just can vary tremendously, that emission factor. And that's why, because it's the process by which it's produced. Now, sulfur dioxide is much more similar to fossil CO2 in its uncertainty. And so this is just related to the life cycle of coal plants, basically, and whether we're building ones that can do it efficiently. You no, know, it, it's more even if you don't, um, the sulfur dioxide emissions, they depend on the sulfur content of the coal, which we tend to track. But also, sulfur is highly combustible. I mean, you don't burn on its own. You can, you can burn lumps of sulfur. So basically, if there's sulfur in the fuel, it's coming out as SO2, almost all of it. So you just have to track what sulfur is in the coal. Now, the, what also helps you with sulfur is that there's no correlation between regions. So the sulfur content of coal in the US has nothing to do with the sulfur content of coal in China. So there's independent uncertainty cancellation. So that helps a little bit. But then the other ones, so land use, land use change, as you've mentioned, as a couple of you mentioned, that's very heterogeneous. We don't have good data. The satellites can help us get land cover, but you know, what was the carbon content of those trees? Well, they can't quite tell you that. You know, what was the carbon in the soil? Can't say anything about that. Um, methane, how does methane get produced? What, what are ways that methane is emitted? <coughs> natural gas combustion. Combustion? Well, natural, natural gas is used, most, a lot of the methane that comes out of the United States from, from electricity production comes from the leakage of methane. Leakage, right. Yeah. So is there one standard leakage rate? I thought it was always like two percent. I've seen estimates as high as nine or ten percent. Oh, I, 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 a lot of the all the papers I've read, they, they like it's usually less than five percent. And that's part of what you're what you're getting at now in their discussion is that's part of the issue is that there is no one leakage yeah. rate. Right? This equipment might leak a lot. That one might leak a little bit. So there's more uncertainty in how much actually comes out. What's another way that they gets through? Right tires. Yeah. And in, car in cattle, right, in our communication. Those are biological processes. Biological processes are generally very sensitive to conditions, temperature, moisture, and so on. Again, that leads to uncertainty. And that's actually why nitrous oxide is so uncertain, because that comes largely from uh, fertilized soils or cultivated soils, for example. And that's biological processes. There's a nitrogen cycle going on there. And the amount of that cycle that comes into NO2 versus N2 or NOx is highly sensitive to basically everything about the system. You know, it's sensitive to the water content, the pore space, the temperature, which means it's hard to pin down. So, so it's kind of so this slide actually is blank. <laughs> so when it's okay, so thinking about we're talking about uncertainty, all these sources, and let me just that for a second. So there's all these other, you know, sources of uncertainty when you go into future projections. Um, we took a look at this one scenario, you know, one example of where we're comparing a scenario to history, and there's even uncertainty what the history you should compare. Um, you know, that over the short term, it's hard to do, you know, the past, the recent past doesn't really, isn't really a good guide to what's going on in the Future. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't have the stock market, I suppose. There's uncertainty in a lot of the input parameters, depending on what you're looking at. I'm going to actually get my notes out and see. But, okay. but any, any thoughts? I mean, what do you conclude from this in terms of projections and uncertainty? Well, broadly speaking, they're a very important consideration. And also, as you see, well, as we see in a lot of projections, the uncertainty uh, increases over time. The farther out you're going to project, the more those the uncertainty comes into play, the more feedback. Right. So I don't have to. All right. There's a right estimate. Okay. So I can just write on this wall. Yes. 
Just this one? All of them. Anyone. Take anyone. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uncertainty um, increases. Yeah. And there's usually unacknowledged uncertainty at the start. I mean, we show these scenarios going from a point, and we really shouldn't do that because they actually are going from a point. Um, well, I guess, I guess, I guess one of the things I can plug is that um, some systems can't really be observed on like a ten to fifteen uh, year time step really, really well. You'd have to. I mean, obviously, the more temporal detail you have, the better, right? So you can't account for everything when you're looking at a 10 to 15 year time step, I guess. So you, you can't, say that again, you can't? Yeah, so from a 10 to 15 year time step, you can't get every little bit of detail. In some systems, you need almost a higher temporal, temporal detail, right? So if you're looking at agriculture or something like that, you want, you want you know, year to year time step, so you can measure shocks and stuff like that. But would it change uncertainty? Uh, not necessarily. I guess, yeah, if you, if you phrase it that way. It, it's yeah. hard to tell. Maybe yeah, some yeah. things it would help and some yeah. things it, there may be, it, it depends maybe what you, I mean, one thing is it depends on what you're looking at. Yeah. Right? Some things you may need higher temporal resolution to get at. Yeah. And then other things it may not help. Yeah. Yeah. So it depends on what you're looking at. I think what I have on this is um, the So now model validation. So this gets at some of the things we're already talking about. Uh, how do you know these models are good? So let's, this was a direct quote from a National Academy of Sciences report. And it says, given inevitable flaws and uncertainties, how should computational results be viewed by those who wish to act on them? The appropriate level of confidence in the results must stem from an understanding of a model's limitations and the uncertainties inherent in its prediction. Ideally, this understanding is obtained from three interrelated processes. So this is, there's verification. Does the computation solve the equations correctly? So that's it, is the model doing what you think it's doing? So that's one. Validation, how accurately does the model represent reality for the things you're interested in? And then uncertainty quantification, how do the various sources of error and uncertainty feed in and, and result in findings of interest. Now, the interesting thing is the first sentence in the summary report was computational models that simulate real-world physical processes are playing an ever-increasing role. So this was, report was all about physical models. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot, of, so the question is how might these principles apply to models that are associated with mm -hmm. So this is sort of the cutting edge of what people are thinking about now. So, there was this really nice um, report, and they have a paper too, they've got Hodges and Newark. Um, 
they said, when is it possible to validate any model? And they came up with these four conditions. They said the model variables are observable because you can't observe something you can, you can't compare it to something real, you can't validate a model. Relationship is, exists, exhibits constancy of structure and time, exhibit constancy across variations and conditions not specified in the model, and permit the conduct collection of ample and accurate data. So, Let's take each of these. So this first one, model variables are observable. Well, maybe I don't. Let's let's talk about that one. What does you know? Where does that? Do we have any issues there with you know the socioeconomic data? Think of all the variables you're looking at in GCAN and so on. I mean, there was some uncertainty. For example, we looked at emissions uncertainty, so we can observe those, but only so well. So that can pose some limits to. I mean, we just like with like Wayne's types. You, you, it's just an estimate. Like you, someone, someone looking at satellite imagery can only guess that this is being used for agriculture. All this is just natural forest, right? Mm -hmm. And there's statistics like from FAO yeah. and so on, but they have their limitations. Yeah. Sure. Okay. How about some, yeah? I think when it comes to some of the some of the other countries. Um, Observing fertilizer inputs and stuff would be very difficult to do. It just would ha would have to be something you calculate based on like sales or something. But I don't mm -hmm. know if you can. I think there's a query for nitrogen input and stuff like that, which would be hard to actually observe. Well, I think your observation has a general meaning. It's not more of a very generalized meaning. An observation could be a government statistical data set. You know, it's a okay. question of you. You know, is it reliable? How about, I mean, one of the things that you get out of GCAM is you, you give it a price and the model responds. How, how observable is that in the real world? Well, at least with my kids in GCAM, every time I'm inputting like prices, it's like we're ranging prices, right? Um, and that's, that's usually, I usually get those numbers based off past, past observations, of, you know what I mean? Well, there's there's two so there's the cost of technology, yeah. which, but that's an input. But then one of the model outputs is if you give it a carbon price, things shift. So mm -hmm. how how observable is that? Mm -hmm. Well, economists work on that a lot. They've been working on it for decades, and the problem is the real world doesn't offer that many clean examples of, okay, we're gonna do a carbon price and not change anything else. Or we're gonna give a price shock for this thing and not change anything else. I mean, that almost never happens in the real world because the background is changing all the time. So, so it's actually very difficult. And we want, in GCAM, we're interested in long run price responses. Because we're saying, well, we're going to have a carbon price that's changing smoothly. We're going to tell everybody. They know it's coming. They can adjust for it. We're not talking about a sudden shock. That's not the type of model this is. And a smooth, long change, that's even harder to observe in the real world. So that's one that makes it challenging because we, we can't observe that. OK, how about the second one? Relationships we can live at constancy of structure and time. First of all, what does that mean? That's tough. So if you give a very vague example, like, you know, if A causes B to increase by this amount, then A will always cause B to increase by that amount, regardless of time. Or there could be a, you know, the equation to model it stays the same. So it's a linear, if it's linear, it's gonna stay linear. If it's exponential, it will stay exponential over time. Yeah, GCAM has a lot of these things, right? That, that, you know, if you increase the demand for passenger transport, then you build these types of cars or if you choose to gain the technology. And, and if we're talking about economics and social systems, what does that imply for constancy of structure and time? Is that something that you would expect? 
to you thinking that you thinking no? Yeah, I can't tell you're dealing with people. Constancy <laughs> is not gonna <laughs> be a guaranteed. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. So that might be a problem. Um, this third one, exhibit constancy across variations and conditions not specified in the model. That means if there's things, you know, you're modeling a number of input parameters, but there's something you don't have in your model, it must, you're assuming it's not important that these relationships don't change. Um, I'm trying to think of an example of that. Um, that we, for example, we're modeling the U.S. for even a U.S. state as a whole, and we're assuming implicitly that everything within that responds the same way, but maybe some groups of people respond differently than other groups, and maybe that's changing over time, for example. And the last one we talked about, I think, was this. this one. So there might be some issues here. So how about the second, and then, then there was a paper in Science that was pretty, uh, Influential, um, and I actually meant to put the I'll put the reference of this paper down here. It's in yeah. I, I I downloaded it. And it's in the it's in your box. Okay, there was some reading material. Yeah. Um, so they concluded that even for models of natural systems, they said verification and validation of numerical models is impossible. And they said this is because natural systems are never closed, and model results are always non-unique. And they say they can confirm that the model, they, they have a term they call confirmation. If you demonstrate the model agrees with observations, but that the primary value of models is heuristic, that it's a learning device. And you see this with models, right? Multiple mo models can get the same result for different reasons or different results. And they're arguing that even for, except in the very simplest of physical natural systems, they say you can't validate these models. So there's even issues with physical models, but let's go on to, so this is an issue. So this is a plot of global temperature change from the CMIP-3 models. So I haven't updated this to CMIP-5 yet, but, um, and <coughs> these are, like this is the S3, S8-2, this is B, to B1, you know, these are sort of scenario groupings that are more in here. But if you look up the history, there's a pretty thick spread of models. And does this graph look familiar? And I'm gonna actually say it probably doesn't unless you've seen me give a talk. Because they actually show you this mm -hmm. graph. Right. So that graph may look more familiar. That's the one that looks familiar. And what they do is climate results are usually presented as normalized over a common historical period. And then they diverge in a little bit more rational way. But there's these offsets in the results. Because they don't all agree on what the temperature of the Earth is, what the temperature of the Earth is today, or how much it rose, you know. And if you look at this, you can actually see as you go back in time, there's a fair bit of spread in sort of how much historic, and that's, that's, that's known. But this sort of offset of what the zero point is, it's rather interesting, that's not trivial. This offset is not, not a trivial part of what this projection is. No one's really looked at that, but it's, it's just a, an example of some of the issues that we have. So they normalize to make the models, you know, to make more sense out of it. So coming back to IMs, this is this points again. So this paper that was one in, in your reading, they talk about basically exactly what you said today. They said physical systems generally exhibit structural consistency. Physics, we assume the laws of physics and chemistry are the same from one year to the next. So that's good. Um, we assume that plant responds to CO2. We may not know it exactly, but we assume that that physics behind that is the same. It's just a question of whether we got it right. Now that is a big question because models differ. But social and economic systems don't exhibit such consistency. We have dynamic market forces influenced by nonlinear technological and behavioral changes are highly uncertain and are subject to rapid changes. 
such as the economic growth in China. You know, there were a set of policies put into place, a set of dynamics, a, um, a world that was ready to buy lots of, you know, say, oh, we can manufacture things cheaply. Great, do it, we'll buy it all from you. You know, all that, there's a lot of things happened together that nobody quite predicted. Um, so economic modelers cannot assume a level of structural rigidity in the economy sufficient to satisfy these criteria. As a result, models that attempt to drive economic systems will not yield accurate results, especially in the long term. So, and that's why we do see these spread in projections. We do that because we and we use scenario now. We don't we don't call these predictions. Predictions, you know, I certainly don't, you because know, I don't think we can project this. We can learn something. So, so I'll go ahead and give away the punchline. Um, so this is the same paper. So we have to face this fundamental reality of inconsistency in structural relationships. So we can't treat economic systems as physical systems. But this does not mean we can't say anything useful. We just have to think about this in the right way. So this, this paper, expanding on this a bit, talked about energy models. And these are actually things that the integrated system community has long been identified, although not always in this word. So these are like seven things that he, I think there may even been some more that he uh, said models are useful for. And the ones that we tend to focus on, there is, it's underappreciated, but I think it's pretty important as a bookkeeping device. You know, because just the fact of setting up a scenario, you have to, I mean, the model will keep all the numbers in order. You know, it, it's, if you use more natural gas, it's gotta be produced somewhere. So you've got the whole system constraint. And that's, that in itself is useful, because you see analysis out there where, yeah, underlying that assumption, somebody does a, you know, more simple analysis, underlying that assumption is a huge increase in something, and that's not accounted for. Well, that's the purpose of GCAMP, is to have all that system in there. Aids in communication and education, I mean, that's helpful. And we actually use these results in this way. To understand bounds or limits on the range of potential outcomes. Well, you were doing that earlier today, right? I mean, you're, you're you know, we tend, we tend to do that. And as aids to thinking and hypothesizing. And that's something we do quite a bit of as well. But when we see these lines, we tend to think of them as predictions, because that's just sort of kind of, I think we're sort of wired or we just expect that. You know. um, but they're not quite predictions. They're, they're conditional predictions. Jay likes to say they're conditional predictions, you know, that condition on that set of inputs. So if we come back to here, if you had all this happen, then this is what we get out. And we did this in the SRES scenarios. We actually harmonized population, GDP, and end use energy demand. So we harmonized three major drivers. And we still got a spread, but it was narrow, you know, relative, it was, wasn't, you still get a spread of results, but if you what harmonize you enough of these things, you don't, you can narrow that down. What do you mean by, what do you mean by harmonizing? With which all the models use the same assumptions for GDP, for population, which is very common. And in that case, we also harmonize the final energy use as well to try to say, okay, this scenario has this sort of energy structure, this sort of energy demand. Yeah. <clears throat> and that would constrain it more because you still got some range of results. And certainly on the economic front, you still get a large range because models have very different responses. So you need to think about what is inside and outside the model. You know, we tend to think sort of all of this is part of the model, but there, there's, you know, sort of this middle part, and a lot of this is input, and some of it is a little blur. So in GCAM, for example, you know, how, how much building floor space per capita is demanded, that's more or less an input. We don't really have a good structural model for that. I want to fix that up a little bit, but um, you know, that's more or less a model input more than an output. 
And so the community's grappling with this. There, there's been some preliminary kind cast experiments and people are doing some more. There's also a lot of focus on diagnostics, looking at historical metrics and behavior and then comparing it to model projections. And it's not that there are a lot of cases where we might actually expect models of the future to be different than history. But at least it's useful to understand if that scenario is different from history. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> I wanted to say, uh, I gave away the, gave it away. But, so, Let's think through an example of what kind of insights an IAM can provide for the future. And let's consider a revolutionary change in transportation technology. And there's three questions. How could this be integrated into GCAM? What are some plausible limits to the application of a, jet te of a technology? And then how would this change energy, water, and land use? So let's take something wild, personal jet pack. Um, I have colleagues that are still upset that we don't see them yet. You know, when I was a kid, we watched the Jetsons. They should have been here by now. Um, so let's think about this. I mean, this is, we don't have something like this in GCAM, but you know, that'd be a cool technology. So the it first- Depends on what the person in Jetpack is running on, right? What type of energy? Yeah, well, there's physics involved. If you're gonna move a human around, it takes a certain amount of energy and you have to supply it somehow. So that's one constraint. Um, could you put this in GCAM? I mean, could this be a transportation technology? I mean, people move around. We have bicycles, walking, car, train. People would have to afford it so it wouldn't be spread evenly across all the regions. Or yeah, perhaps probably, there'd be some, uh, probably wouldn't be necessarily cheap. So you've got to come up with some idea of how much energy we use. The fuel, yeah. Type of fuel. Yeah. I mean, we have hydrogen, so you know, that might be fuel. How, um, how about limits to its application in a service sense? I mean, if you had your personal jet pack, what would you use it for? Come here to class. Commute. Joyride. <laughs> yeah. So maybe you might like spend energy just zipping around in the air, right? I just been in China. Would that be a good use? Uh, maybe not. <laughs> you could get to get to China, no. But you would get there. If you're talking about services, you probably get there and rent one, right? Right. Car. So that's a so that. But there's different types of transportation service. So you want to think about. Okay, maybe this couldn't take over all transportation services. It would just be some of them. Right, right. And you'd have to assume other things, like you know, that people don't collide in the air, you know, <laughs> things like that. But if that happens, um, and then okay, energy. So you'd have to, you would have to use energy. You could. Presumably, look up, you know, find a physicist or you know somebody who wants to tell you how much energy it would take, and, you know, put in the efficiency. There are jetpacks out there; they have done it. Um, they're pretty bulky. <laughs> Any other thoughts on this? Well, for land use, it could provide access to areas of land that were difficult to access before, so yeah. maybe they were, they were main capped, you know, in the forest, and now you could build houses there out of ground. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Probably need less roads, or? Mm -hmm. Might make, like, other air travel, like, obsolete, so, like, you wouldn't fly airplanes as much. I don't, you know, I don't know, it depends on how, right? Couldn't fly, you couldn't fly airplanes around these things, probably. <laughs> of course, how about, um, you know, would this make sense? Maybe, you know, in Alaska in the winter, it's snowing, it's 10 below zero. Yeah. 
So maybe it's not applicable everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. In all seasons, they might need some alternatives. I would work at all in the rain. Yeah, it might not be that comfortable in the rain. It could work, but you just wouldn't want to do it. <laughs> do you yeah. know the like amount of fuel it would consume? Like, well, yeah. That's something that could be as well. Yeah. I mean, and it, you know, you're taking. I am a physicist, so you know I can think of rules about it. But you know, for normal transportation, you're not really fighting gravity; you're just fighting friction, for the most part. Whereas this, you're actually fighting gravity. So you know, it, it, it might take a lot of energy. So and that gets so expensive, right? So this might be a luxury item. It might be like uh, you know, equivalent to a recreational vehicle, which we don't have in GCAM, but those are in the air pollution model because they're actually, all these off-road sources are a big source of air pollution in the US. And they're actually pretty sizable. Um, so, you know, there, there are things that, they're an energy source that we just sort of lump in with it, you know, a bunch of other things, but it's actually from the air pollution standpoint, it's important. We're actually gonna break some of those out. We're not gonna have recreational vehicles, but we're gonna take out some of these mobile sources because they have very different air pollution. So that gets to the homework. <laughs> so I didn't bet this with Banner first, but <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> anyway. So I was gonna pick a, pick a potential change in technology. You know, something that's a little on the radical side, just to, because what that does is it, it helps you think through, you know, it's not subtle. I don't want you to think about subtle things, don't you think about you know, big things. You know, putting a different type of CCS in, there's a lot of subtlety with that. So we don't need to be subtle here. So you want to answer these questions. So do pick something where you can plausibly answer the first one yes, because the whole point is to answer the other <laughs> questions. Um, and and summarize your conclusions. You know, you could either write, you know, a page of narrative or you can have bullet points, you know, whatever works for you. Write it down, please, because this will be homework. We want to see it. Um, and it doesn't have to be an energy technology. It could be, I mean, think, think, what are some things that might, you know, be big changes that people talk about? I've got one. Yeah. Uh, agricultural, I know they're they're looking at different farming techniques for you to farm inside of the building. Uh -huh. You can farm vertically. Yeah, vertical, farm. vertical farms, and they're supposed to supply. Yeah, that's a good example. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so what other ones? Well, we we should both do it. So we can have, because I know nothing about them. Oh, yeah, okay, in that case, yeah, I'm doing it. <laughs> what are some other examples of the changes? Well, one thing I can think of is electric cars. Cars that run on electricity rather than fuel. Mm -hmm. And also the uh, cars powered by solar energy. So it's a big panel on the top of the car. Mm -hmm. So that one, so people, if you do a little, so, so there's these solar cars races, right? Yes. Have you seen one? No. Nope. So they go really slow because it turns out that they make them really, really light. So it's the weight of the person plus just a little bit, you know, very hyper light. And they go really slow because there's not enough energy density in sunlight falling on the roof of a vehicle to give you a lot of power. So um, that's why we have to store it and have a battery. So, that, so that's one where if you do the research, you find, well, maybe it actually isn't, we wouldn't do much. I think the big ones like photovoltaic roads, stuff like that, where you make the, the, like the surface of the road. That's a nice one. Okay, that, that would be a neat one. So you think about that. What are, what are there's some uh, other ideas? I saw, I mean, it was just on the road, road thing. I saw in um, England they're trying to introduce uh, a, a lane that you drive your electric car over and it charges it. Mm -hmm. um, cool. 
I don't know how that happens. It's, it's our, probably RF charging. You're, you're working in state even for the home chargers that you don't have to plug in. You just sort of have it. Your That's just an your field chargers. Get some water. Uh, I was just saying on the car out, there's also the idea of you if you switch to all self driving cars. Uh huh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how about in areas of like, uh, so you had an agriculture example. How about other like land use type or, or you know, urbanization? Any, any good example there? Large scale rainwater harvesting. Yeah? Yeah. Or any sort of water distribution system so that, you know, we always talk, I know people always make jokes about, you know, if you could melt the snow that that comes in a blizzard, you know, like effect, or lake effect snow, like just from New York and transport that to California, you know, what would happen? Some things I think about might not be possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for the, I mean, but for water, the big, Big use of water is ag, so if you were to reduce, I mean, find crops that require very little water, what would that do to the entire mix? Mm -hmm. Another example might be, you know, people talk about eco-cities and new urbanism, you know, where, you know, you reduce driving, you reduce your footprint. I mean, how could something, you know, that, that's how could something like that, it's sort of nebulous, but how could something like that put into an IEM? You know, what would you have to tweak to make sure you do that? Well, so like GCAM doesn't take into account even infrastructure density or anything like that, but it would take into account you know, floor space mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So you're building up rather than you know, out. I mean, maybe there'd have to be a combination of, remember when you can have you know, you can do, you don't have to do it all here, right? Yeah. Some things can be here, some things can be here. So that's something you can think about. That was that's actually it. So think about that. Yeah. So this homework assignment isn't like the others. Usually we vary in plot. So is this something we'll present maybe or write? Yeah, because I mean the idea of this homework and you know Steve can elaborate is is, is that not not necessarily be a GCAM homework, but more in an IAM process type. So yeah. yeah, so you can you know prepare a slide or picture if you create a new technology, create a picture of it too, you know. But the key thing is, <laughs> <laughs> cool. yeah. I want to do the art. But the key thing is think about the modeling issues. You know, the idea is thinking of something big, something big, sort of, you know, maybe even outlandish, but something, you know, that's why I picked the jetpack art so you can't do that one. But um, I guess you maybe could have it. But it's it's something think about, okay, how what are you know, think through those issues of okay, if this was there was a big change. And we're talking about hundred years. I mean, there's a lot of things people could come up with in a hundred years, right? So, and then the issue is how would you, from what you know about GCAM or a model like GCAM, it doesn't have to be exact, you don't have to get into detail, or just, you know, integrate assessment model of this type, which has a fair bit of process detail. <coughs> what things would you tweak? What levers could you use? Could you just slot it in very easily or not? You know, what would you have to consider? What research would you have to do? You know, like the energy, you, know, you don't have to do the research, but you would want to lay out, okay, we need to understand the energy requirements or the water, you know, for this technology, it's the water that's a big deal or not, or you know, whatever. So, think through, and it, it's sort of not, it's, it's in part of an exercise for, you know, how to think about using a model, how to think about what the model is good for in the fir first place. Set it up to sort of like combine, taking it fresh out. Sounds like a fun activity. Sounds good. <laughs> good. Oh, well, supposed to be fun. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. All right. Now we're all thinking about yes. <laughs> potential technology. Yep. There we go.
on this next Monday? So, yeah, so we should present this on Monday. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. So write, write a little something and then yeah. make a slide or two? Yep. Mm -hmm. There you go. And um, can I get these slides from you so to post and then, you know, you'll have this as well. And also for the, for the three students that are not here. Absolutely. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Steve. Thanks very much.